and prepare you for jobs, that's okay because those same skills are going to also prepare you for, to be great citizens. So, in response to this work on the need for people who can solve instructor problems, ABCU has issued the Leap Challenge. And I'm going to actually read this so, to put my reading glasses on. So, um, Although this might actually be far enough away that I have my glasses. <laughs> so the LEAP Challenge uh, calls for every student to experience multiple high-impact assignments and projects that prepare them to integrate and apply their learning to complex questions and problems. Building from these preparatory experiences, all students should complete a significant project before they graduate. Students' signature work should become the new marker of quality in higher education. So this is ASU's design solution for a world of unscripted problems. It's that every student should complete signature work. So earlier, I, you know, we talked about the emerging digital ecosystem. What does signature work look like in the emerging digital ecosystem? I think Laura mentioned some of the qualities earlier. It's stuff that lasts. It's stuff that students can take with you, take with them. Um, but let me share a couple of examples that I've seen. And I will say I've seen just even yesterday, several of the presentations that I think coming up today, I saw presentations that really do meet those criteria of signature work. But here's some more examples for you. So one example might be the Century America project. This is a project of the Council of Public Global Arts Colleges. Uh, for this project, uh, students at each college in the, con in the consortium participated in an inter-campus collaborative class taught by two faculty members. Uh, one was Jeff Perkin at Mary Washington University. And they met twice a week. They studied um, digital humanities, digital history, tools, and methods. But they also studied the Great War. Uh, it's called Century America because the project started in 2014, which is 100 years after the start of World War I. So although they were studying the sort of dominant historical narrative about the Great War, students also participated in independent projects that focused on the experience of the Great War in their own community. So here's a project from Truman College in Missouri. Uh, it collected letters from the local community. Um, and letters were digitized and then they're shared on this website called No Man's Land. So students um, got the opportunity to learn to produce digital projects that last and can still go to this website and see these projects. But they also learned in another fashion. So while they were learning sort of the big picture of the Great War, they also got a really close focus picture of what it looked like in their community. But I think it's also important that they got to compare notes with different communities all around the country and how they experienced the Great War. And I don't know that it's coming out on the website. I talked to Jeff about the class and he said one of the interesting things is that as the students focused on the data they were gathering from their own communities, they found that a lot of those sort of big trends they talk about, they weren't seeing locally. So it really gives them the opportunity to engage and sort of compare theory and practice um, and to engage uh, uh, with the world around them. Sorry, no, I got to have three cups of coffee every day. This is my bed. <laughs> um, so this is what signature work looks like in our emerging digital ecosystem. But um, let me give you a couple other examples. Another example, this is another one from history. Um, is the Minecraft and History Project. Uh, this is a project by Tony Graham. He uh, teaches in Canada. Um, and he has his students study the portrayal of history in digital media. Uh, and the final project that they do for their class is they actually create Minecraft worlds that embody uh, what they've been studying. And they were given three sites, History of the Ottawa Valley, uh, Canadians on the Western Front of Number One, or they could do uh, colonization and resistance in the Roman Empire. And they create these Minecraft worlds, but that, that, that's not the only thing they do. They also have to write a paper alongside it that actually explains the choices they make. Why do they decide to portray things in this way? What is the data that's behind their portrayal? So it's not just, you know, my son can create a Minecraft world. But they actually have to have the research behind what it was they were creating. So this is another version of what a signature work might look like engaging in this kind of ecosystem. All of this is available on uh, Sean's GitHub site. GitHub is a version tool for producing software. So you can uh, actually go download these Minecraft worlds and play them if you're interested. Um, or consider the uh, projects that are showcased in Lewis and Clark's 
interdisciplinary initiatives situated in the global environment. These are projects that combine high-impact practices like undergraduate research, community-engaged learning, and study abroad with social media and digital tools. So students are doing research while they're abroad, they're engaging with the communities, um, and all of this is aggregated onto one website and ends up producing shared bibliographies, uh, shared data, um, shared concept maps, so very collaborative, and it's something that aggregates over time. So multiple semesters, these projects are happening and it's all going to one website. So you kind of see some things aggregating and building up. So like many of the projects that I heard about yesterday, these are a great example about what is possible to produce in our emerging digital ecosystem as we are thinking about helping students produce signature work. I love all these projects, but I have to tell you, it's not enough. Right? Because think about it. If you have that one isolated professor who's doing that great digital assignment, yay! <laughs> but that professor's going to have to work very hard if every other professor at the university hasn't been also participating and thinking about this. So the next design challenge we need to think about is how do we scaffold signature work in the emerging digital ecosystem? How do we prepare students to get to the senior level and be able to create the Century America project, mind project history, situating the global environment. We need to think about ways to build these skills into the curriculum. And so yesterday, when I heard about Bryn Mawr's project on digital competency, I was excited to hear about that. Uh, do you guys know what other projects I know? What is it? Is it Cuca College? What? Coica. Coica. So if you're here from there, I want to talk to you later. College. Uh, and their project that's also focused on digital literacy. Uh, I know Virginia Commonwealth University also has started a project to um, redesign their little education, their general education requirements around the concept of connected learning. So we're starting to see colleges and universities engage in this, think about how do we scaffold this across the curriculum. And this is really getting beyond information literacy. I think that's part of it. But it's really how are we creating digital agency? And that's what we need to think about doing. So, just to help you think about that, I'm going to give you my vision of what it would look like, what it would take to scaffold signature work in the emerging digital ecosystem. I think we might start out with something like social annotation. And I know there's a um, Salon 3 workshop later today, uh, although I have to give a shout out to my colleague Mike who's presenting at the same time in another workshop. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't recommend one about the other. Uh, but, you know, reading is one of those skills uh, that we all think our students know how to do when they come to college. And yet sometimes we're not really sure how they're reading. We're like, did you do the reading? And if you did, <laughs> what were you doing? So I think one of the great things about social annotation is that it actually helps us surface reading practices. Um, so this is actually a screenshot of Classroom Salon. And if you notice, uh, there's highlighting over here on one side and there's annotations on the other side. What's interesting about the highlighting is there's like one little piece that's in red, and that's a passage that was highlighted by more people. So you actually get a heat map of how students are reading, and if they do this before they come to class, you can look at that and actually figure out. If they, if they were asked to highlight important concepts, then you can see, did they get the important concepts? Is this a red herring? <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, I talked to someone who uh, uses another tool called the MIT's Annotation Studio. And she found that actually, often, her students weren't getting it. And so this was really instructive. Another way you might use this is by asking them to highlight and answer whether they have questions. And this can kind of guide what you do in class. Um, Students are also modeling for each other how to read. Um, I think reading is, you know, one of those interesting things that to me reminds me of really the shape of the technology, right? Just as we all assume they can read, but then we realize they can read critically, you know, we all assume, yeah, they come to college, they know how to use technology, but they probably don't know how to use technology critically. And that's what we need to be building. Those are the kind of skills we need to think about. So, um, engaging with critical reading through social annotation might be one place to start. We should also probably start them off thinking about data and getting them to collect data. So one way to do it um, is uh, by, in like science classes, having them go out and collect data in the world around them. Um, 
One tool that you can use for this is an app called iNaturalist. Does anyone use this one? So we use this uh, at St. Edmunds, we have a nature preserve that was gifted to the university. It's kind of a gift like a puppy, you gotta keep that. <laughs> but, um, so uh, you can go out to, to the Wild Basin uh, Natural Research Area and you can use the iNaturalist app to take pictures of flora and fauna. This is a special type of crowdsourcing called citizen science. Um, the uh, director of Wild Basin, created the Wild Basin Biodiversity Project. And this uh, is actually a few years old, but all the visual points on the map are places where people had captured data using the iNaturals app. It all feeds into one database, it's mapped so you can kind of see where they were on the wilderness preserve. This data in turn becomes a source of data that other more advanced students can actually use to study. So a lot of this data is actually field trips. Elementary schools come out here and make field trips, but they, you can hand them phone and they can take pictures and uh, it'll feed to this. Um, this becomes something that Ed Ayers has termed generative scholarship. It's not scholarship that closes down interpretation, it's scholarship that opens up interpretation. So this data can be used to answer the unscripted problem of the environment in central Texas. Another uh, way that you can kind of get at generative scholarship might be using free, so, uh, sorry, free text analysis tools that are openly available online. So, it's another quiz for you. What's wrong with this picture? Stop words. <laughs> yeah, great. Great. Yeah, you have the articles and the prepositions in there because somebody did not turn on their stop words. <laughs> so if you turn those on, you get rid of all the E's, the A's, the with, and the two. Um, this is a word cloud of Virgil's and Nia, a translation of Virgil's and Nia. I assigned this to students in my um, intermediate Latin class, and I didn't tell them about stock words. I wanted to see if they could figure it out on their own. Some of them did, and some of them didn't. Even though I pointed them to a site where they could read the directions. <laughs> see, they need agency. <laughs> um, they need to figure out how to keep pushing, right? They need persistence and grit. Uh, so, but what was interesting about this was even without the stock words on, it actually helped my students gain insight into Virgil's use of the ablative and the data, which is something I've been telling them all semester up until. But when I saw it visually, that's the prepositions that keep showing up here. It actually kind of brought the point home. Once we turned stop points, stop words on, it also became a starting point for discussion about themes in Virgil. So this wasn't where it ended, but this is where it started. And this kind of qualitative approach to text analysis was actually interesting because while I had some students who were classics majors who were all about doing sort of literature, close reading of text, literary interpretation, for students who this was their last language class before they went on to their other major, um, this kind of quantitative approach gave them another way into the text. So it was actually kind of really interesting. You know, it made sense to think about, oh, okay, this is a list of words and if something shows up more often, maybe that's important. <laughs> Uh, so that's another way we can help them engage with digital tools. As we move into the intermediate level, we return to the world of the Fitbit. So um, we need to help students gain agency and looking at their own personal data. So an assignment that did this at St. Edwards, uh, Mike Wasserman, professor of environmental science and policy, he taught abroad in France last fall, and he got a grant, uh, internal grant uh, from IT, to buy Fitbits for all of his students. And he wanted to test the hypothesis that the more you interact with nature, the healthier you are. So he had students tracking their personal data, so things like sleep, steps, um, heart rate, and then reflecting on it, and also tracking what it was they were eating in France, what kind of activities they were doing, how often they were engaged with nature, to kind of see, is there a difference between what I'm experiencing in France and what I'm getting back home? One of the uh, interesting things that happened was that uh, they were over there doing Paris attacks. So he was actually interested in going out. Maybe something else to study and do things like that. <laughs> but this is something that helps students engage with their own data. Um, we also thought it was interesting to have a university essential learning outcome on physical and um, emotional well being. And this is one that we tend to think happens in the co curriculum, but it's actually engaged in the curriculum. So helping students own their own data. But if you take this idea a little bit, think about it. What if they wanted to track their own data about how they were learning and then they could use that to improve how they were learning 
or as a friend of mine likes to say, what if they were fitness for education? And they use them, you know, beyond just the grade. So. Um, another way that we might have students gaining more agency is by getting out there and engaging in virtual communities. So this is a wiki story project that um, comes out of a collaborative group called FemTechNet. Are there any, is there anyone in here who's got a FemTechNet or knows about it? Yes, Laura. And Jenny, great. So FemTechNet connects, um, one of the things it does is collaboratively is it connects notable courses that study feminism and technology. Um, the, this slide is taken from a course that happened, uh, I think it was 2014 maybe, um, and it was, there were classes in the US, Canada, and the UK. One of the things that they did was they leveraged the power of networks for collective action. So Wikistorming is going in and editing Wikipedia. But it's important to note that they didn't just go in and wiki edit Wikipedia and then leave. Because, I don't know if you've experienced this, but when you do that, your edit cover aren't going to stick. What they learned was how do you engage with the Wikipedia community, which means sustained engagement across the semester, participating with the community so that when you do something, your edits actually stick. This is what community-engaged learning looks like in a virtual community. But you can also use technology to engage with your local community. So, hi, Laura. <laughs> this is Laura's project. She's sitting right back here. Um, she used a story mapping project where she has students actually uh, interview people in the local community to get oral histories, and then those stories are then mapped, and you can see a story mapping that Rob is doing work that in you. Is that still good? Yay. Okay. Um, so, using technology to again gather local history, local stories, and then using the mapping analysis to aggregate that data as a way of approaching and analyzing the data. So, this kind of repeated intentional engagement and these kinds of experiences prepare students to do digital signature work. So, signature work in the emerging digital ecosystem. I also want to highlight some of the characteristics that we see in this kind of work. And we kind of heard this earlier. Um, this kind of work is really breaking down the traditional academic structure of the course. It's breaking down boundaries. So, whether it's an ongoing faculty project or ongoing project where data and work is aggregated over the semester, um, it sort of breaks down the boundaries of the semester. Uh, it extends student work into virtual spaces like Minecraft or Wikipedia. Um, it breaks down boundaries between institutions through intercampus collaboration, and it engages students with communities, whether that's virtual communities, local communities, uh, local communities. Uh, so when we think about blending, I want you to think about blending in these terms. It's not just online and face-to-face -face delivery. It's really working across blending all of these different modes of learning. So what I've been describing is a vision for scaffolding digital signature work in a way that would reach the capstone level. This has to be intentional. It can't be one-off, and you can't do it alone. So really, our next job is to go back to our campuses and figure out who else is doing it and work with them so that we can begin to prepare students to get to that capstone level. Um, you know, I often, again, hear that fallacy, right, that, oh, our students are on technology all the time. They're digital natives. They're digital savvy. They know what they're doing. But if you really look at it, they really don't do critical use of technology. Um, we do a freshman technology poll every year for our students. We ask them about creative uses of technology. Who's out there just producing things? What do you do online? And less than a fourth of them, less than a quarter, are doing creative things online as they come into college. You know what they're doing online? 90% of them? Anyone want to guess what 90% of them do online? Yeah, Snapchat, social media. They're doing social media of some type or other. So we really do have to help them. And I know I also hear you know, faculty saying, well, I'm not digitally savvy. I don't know technology. But I guarantee you, whatever technology you're using, you are using it in a far more sophisticated ways than your students are. So you might not be doing as many different things as they do, but you are doing it at a higher level than they are. And that's the experience you need to help them get. So we have this kind of scaffold for digital student to work. It starts out with core skills like reading, gathering data, and then it moves up so that they um, 
they're so they start using digital tools and resources, they begin contributing to digital tools and resources, and then they move up to the point where they can then produce those digital tools and resources, like the Century America project. So by engaging students in this way, we can help them develop agency in the emerging digital ecosystem. We really need to move from a form of higher education where we're the ones connecting things for our students to a world in which they are able to make those connections for themselves. Thank you.
Um, I do know that the poll that ASMU does every year for employers says that the number one skill that employers are looking for is teamwork. And yet, I think although we give our students group work, sometimes we forget to tell them why. Or how. Or how, right? And this is, it's not natural. You do have to learn these things by practicing. Yes. Jen. I would say two things too. Also, it's helpful for them to be able to reflect on the group work, what went well, what didn't, what might they do next time, right? We sometimes forget to build that in as a sort of how am I developing those skills. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say is I went to the COIL network. I don't know. Yeah. Network, yes. Online. Collaborative online international learning. Yeah. And, and the idea there is particularly for in programs or for students who are not going abroad, how do you give them that experience? Well, one of the things I came away with as someone from a residential liberal arts college is if you so our students don't chat because they see one another in the hall. And they've told me this, you know. It's like, well, why would I do a post this online because I'm going to see her tomorrow, you know, or whatever. But if you set up a project where they're working with someone whom they will not see online, that's really how to get the, um, the interaction. If you want them to have experiences with digital tools, you know, I think that's, that's a good a way of doing it and breaking down that sort of, oh, but I just see them tomorrow. Right, yeah, and you want to, again, to have both of these experiences. You need to get them out of the bubble, right? Um, I'm going to actually pitch a project, because this also will answer your question. A lot of the work I do is about collecting models. Um, and this is a virtual project I've been working on since 2012, called Digital Pedagogy and Humanities, Concept Models and Experiments. Um, it's a digital project that we published in the auspices of the MLA, but the whole thing is up in GitHub right now, and what we're doing is four of us were co-editing it. And what we did is we reached out to people we knew and asked them to curate pedagogical artifacts, collect pedagogical artifacts that might be assignments, syllabi, or student work, or resources, um, and we assigned people different keywords. So I would say uh, if you're interested in finding examples of both collaborative work, but also of people who were doing project management students, um, you can go and look at some of the keywords in there. So one of the keywords is professionalism, and I think project management gets hit it, it, in that one. There's also a keyword for collaboration. But anyway, there's a lot of different examples, and the way it works is for each keyword, there's a thousand word essay kind of describing what the keyword is, why is it relevant to digital pedagogy, um, and then there's this collection of artifacts, and the artifacts are annotated. And to me, this just gave me many more examples to look at. So, um, and this will finish being published this year. Yay! <laughs> uh, so that's, again, a good place to look for examples. And there are, there will be over 50 keywords, and that's 10 examples of each one. So that's going to be over 500 resources. And once it's out there and available, uh, it's also going to be possible for people to start contributing. So we want to put a critical mass out there. Our other thesis is once it's all there, we're going to step back and reflect and say, well, what is digital pedagogy? And you've heard a little bit about what I think that is today. So, um, Sharon, you're the right man. Yeah, okay, sorry. So, I'm going to repeat what you just said. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, she actually shared an example of the SUNY COIL project, so Collaborative Online and International Education, was saying that if you're at a face-to-face -face college, um, if you can't get your students to collaborate virtually with each other because they see each other face-to-face, -face, get them to collaborate virtually with someone somewhere else. Yes? Could you say a word or two about um, how and the value Right. Uh, when you are creating, say, with the you know, data points along the like, order quality, <coughs> something was done by a fifth grade class that might be better than it was done by the, the college class. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, how do you know which one is high quality and which is low quality? Uh, right. I mean, quality? on the one hand, I think this is one of the things that our students need to learn. How do you know? So we teach them information literacy. Um, if you're looking at their signature work, um, you know, one way is having it published openly online, 
But not even though you put things out there publicly, right? Not everyone's going to look at it. Um, I think there is a responsibility of the instructor there. And a lot of instructors, for signature work on unscripted problems, right? It's going to be based on rubrics, probably. But again, if you're engaging with community partners, in part, it's going to be a role for community partners to do some of that evaluation as well. Um, and I think, you know, it's how do we tell we've got the right answer for what we do in the new day is if we start engaging with lots of people. Um, I will say one project uh, that does this in an interesting way, uh, there's a project called the Map of Early Modern London. Does anyone? Okay. MOMO. Map of Early Modern London, and you can Google it. Um, and so it's four linked digital projects, but they started a pedagogic project in which students can contribute to the map and to the um, encyclopedia that goes with it. So this is sort of context for Shakespeare, right? Uh, but to ensure that the student work that gets contributed is good enough, the teacher of the class actually becomes the guest editor. The students are all credited as contributors. They're given guidelines. Here's what it has to, here are the standards that this project goes by. Uh, your teacher as guest editor is responsible for making sure you hit those standards. And it really shifts the position of the students. So they are now doing professional work. They can go look at other models to kind of see what the standards are. They can read the editorial guidelines. Um, and they learn by doing, but they can't just settle for a C. They've got to get an A because otherwise it's not going to make it. You know, it won't be included. So I think that's another way that we can kind of approach that. One last question. Or we could all finish and get more coffee. Go ahead. Thank <laughs> you. 